Hello and thank you for joining our launch webinar of AHDB Dairy's Strategic Dairy Farm in Leicestershire. My name is Shirley Macmillan and I'm one of the Dairy Knowledge Exchange Managers and I'll be working with dairy farmers George and Ben Wade and their father Martin over the next three years to help them achieve some goals at Honeypot Farm in Husbands Bosworth near Market Harborough. As well as the Wade family, I'm joined by AHDB's Head of Dairy Development, Nick Parsons, who will put their farm into context as part of our network of 25 strategic dairy farms. Because of the continuing coronavirus restrictions, we are holding this first meeting as a webinar, but the plan is to run on-farm meetings as soon as we have the appropriate guidance from government. Some um, housekeeping for today's webinar. Everybody is muted, uh, but you can ask questions using the chat function at the side of your screen as we're going along. All questions are private and your identity won't be displayed. If we can't answer your question during this webinar, we will get back to you later. Um, if you are a Dairy Pro member, which is the industry's continuing professional development scheme, you can type in your farm name and membership details into the questions box and that will register you for points. Today's webinar has been recorded and it will be available on YouTube afterwards and we will be finished by one o'clock latest. If you have any technical problems with this, I'm afraid that the standard advice is still the simplest. You have to switch off and log back in again. Uh, the Strategic Dairy Farm Programme aims to showcase the best practice, um, but the farmers who have gone through the selection process still want to improve. They want to do this by inviting other dairy farmers onto their farms, not only to learn from industry experts together, but very much from other farmers through discussion and ideas. So your questions are really valuable input and please feel free to type them in as we're going along. George and Ben are running two autumn block calving herds at Honeypot Farm with the support and experience from the dad Martin. Honeypot Farm is the home business which converted from a high yielding all year round calving herd and last year the family partnership set up a second greenfield site unit and the brothers have got goals of making 10 p a litre profit on both farms and they've also set their sights on being in the top 5% of farms nationally. So meet the family. Um, we've got from the left George Wade in the middle brother Ben and their dad Martin on the right and we'll find out how Martin got into a partnership at Honeypot, how this herd's developed over the years and what plans George and Ben have got um, and how, how they started up the new unit and where they want to take it. So we'll first ask Martin to introduce the farm and a bit of background because he didn't actually inherit Honeypot farm via the conventional route Martin, just tell us about how you got to Honeypot and what you did. Uh, well, I started in 1979 with Cliff. Um, worked there for about three years. Uh, then I, I left to do an agrochemical course, a basis course at Sire and Sester. Uh, but I still helped him at weekends and evenings. Um, and then uh, eventually he, he said he had no family. He wanted the farm to carry on going forward and would I form a partnership with him uh, and after a bit of consideration we agreed and uh, it all went from there. What kind of cow numbers and acres did you have at that time? Uh, it was a hundred cows, British Friesian, five and a half thousand litres, self-feed silage, loose yarding and set stocking. Very good. Now we'll just have a look at this farm as a, we've got a one minute film to load, it might take a few seconds and then we'll ask Martin a bit more about the system.
That was a really good aerial shot there, being able to see everything in a different angle if we can't get on farm and have a kick about ourselves. You can really see how this British dairy farm has expanded and developed over the years. So Martin, what happened um, in terms of system that you ran and how did herd size grow until George came home? Um, well, we slowly built up in the cow numbers over the years. We got up to about just over 300 Holsteins on TMR or the era carbon and 9,000 litres. Mm. What made you decide to go to an autumn block calving herd? Well, all three of us joined a discussion group um, and uh, we went on some several visits and saw some excellent block carving operators who were making more profit than us with a simpler system. Okay, so George, um, how did you get into that autumn block? How did you make it happen? Um, well, the first thing we did was um, we had all the replacement heifers carved in the autumn at the front of the block. And then the first year we stopped uh, serving for three months of the year. Um, and then the second year we stopped for six months. Then over the next three years, we just slowly reduced it into a 15 week block. And it's only been the last two years we've really had a 12 week block. OK, so what were the easy bits, do you think? And might, what were the snags of changing to autumn block carving? Um, there was nothing particularly easy or hard it was just a completely different mindset that you had to get in um it was hard to adjust especially when you see cows bullying and you try not to serve them yeah but um it was definitely the best thing we've ever done it just makes life easier on and off the farm and uh, managing one cow in one group rather than lots of different cows at different stages of their lact lactations yeah and um Talk us through the, some of the other changes that you made, feeding and grazing. What else did you change? The first thing we did, um, we had no parlour feeders, um, so we installed those. Um, we invested heavily in cow tracks, uh, water troughs, um, grass the whole farm down, electric fence dip, all for paddock grazing. Yeah, came away from uh, TMR. Um, bought a forage box um, and now we feed 60% maize and 40% grass silage and just cake in a parlour. Okay we've just got one question in just now from somebody asking knowing what you know now what would you do differently about changing to an autumn block? Um, it's a hard one really I'd like to have done it faster but yeah it's um not always that easy because our fertility was so poor to start off with that's why we sort of yeah. did it in such a steady a gradual stage yeah um, but yeah oh, i don't i'm just so glad we did it really it's the best thing we've ever done on the farm that's really good we'll um <clears throat> we'll say let's take a look at some of the farm technical and financial details so if you talk us through these numbers on the screen there we've got yeah. uh, 1200 acres yeah well we farm 1200 acres it's all rented yeah. apart from Dad owns 60 acres and uh, all three of us own 30 between us. Um, there's 470 acres in a ring fence at home, which is the grazing platform for both farms. And we've yeah. got 615 acres off farm, which is used for young stock grazing and growing grass and maize, maize silage. OK. And tell us a bit more about cow numbers and breed, cow type. Well, we milk about 370 cows here at the moment. Um, they're a mix of British Friesian and grazing Holsteins. They're about 550 kilograms average. Mm -hmm. We do 8,000 litres, uh, 5,000 litres from forage. The fats are averaging about 4.3 and the proteins are 3.6. And we sell it to uh, Muller, which on a yeah. Tesco liquid contract. Okay then. So um, we're just going to um, show another film. This is going to look at the grazing platform from the air. And as we do that, we'll just get George to tell us what we can see. Uh, George, if you can you mute yourself there, can you tell us what we can see? To the left, there's a track. Yeah, that's the main track of the farm. Um, you can, in the distance, you can see half the grazing herds because the other half of um, are dry and they've just um, been on this field here you can see on the right hand side that was standing hay it looks a bit muddy because it rained all week while they're in there but oh okay it's, yeah it's it's come back quite nicely actually yeah um, and then just to the right. 
yeah, as it's as it's coming around to the right, there's just a bit of hay we made there because that is a paddock where we carve all the cows in, but it just got too long for standing hay, so we've had to mow it quickly, and then hopefully it will grow back for when we start carving. Yeah, and it looks like you've got plenty of water troughs in these paddocks as well. Yeah, yeah, we try and have at least two in uh, in each paddock for the cows. Yeah, and when do you get turned out? Um, turn out, try and turn out February, March. It's normally March because of the weather, really. But it's and then graze them till mid October. And that's fairly consistent year to year. Uh, well, I wouldn't, well, we try. That's what we aim for. It's just weather dependent, obviously. Yeah. We've had a question in that says, "What challenges do you think climate change will bring to grazing?" Oh, uh, yeah, that's a hard one, especially because we're on. Well, we're on heavy clay, so it's it is quite good for drought tolerance, but it's also yeah. not very good if it rains all the time. Um, but I don't so really know. Be, you're going to be managing extremes, aren't you? Yeah, which is. Mm. It's not great, but we've luckily we've got good sheds, you know, to put the cows next to where it gets too bad. And good infrastructure, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned standing hay. I'm just going yeah. to move my slide on. Yep, here we are. Uh, just tell us how you grow this. Um, well, it's just uh, just we choose some grazing paddocks on the platform, just and um, have probably got away for grazing we just bulk it up for six seven weeks wait till it's headed and then we strip graze the dry cows on it okay that sounds good another question that's come in that says what are the key traits of a grazing holstein for somebody looking to convert from all year round carving and well we've just gone for the smaller holstein really rather than the uh, extreme and the large one high, that requires high fertility, a lot of food. High fertility yeah. yeah good Okay, so just looking at this carving block, when does autumn carving start and finish for you? Um, it starts about the 24th of August um, and then the yeah, for 12 weeks from that really, just before we start AI in, which is normally just okay. November time. And what made you pick autumn carving and not spring? Um, well, it was quite a big decision we had really um i think it was it's just for us being where we are it was a lot safer um regarding the rain cover um and just it was easier for us to change from uh, all year round to autumn carving and especially being on a liquid contract is suited to autumn rather than a spring block carving system yeah Oh, another question about the standing hay fence. How often do you move that? Um, it's moved every 24 hours, so they just allocated a day's worth of grass, so they rip it right to the floor. Okay, that's good. Um, just talk us through your mating policy in terms of how long for AI and then whether you use any bulls. Yeah, well, um, we serve black and white for three weeks to the cows and the heifers, um, then the cows are carried on. Um, served AI'd with uh, Aberdeen Angus bull for the last nine weeks and then after three weeks of serving the heifers we chuck in uh, stock bulls Aberdeen Angus again and they with, ran with them for nine weeks. Okay and have you tried any sex semen on the herd? Yeah we tried some this year um, in the first couple of weeks and our conception rate dropped from uh, 58 to 48 percent so we're not going to try it again this year. Okay. It's had too big, too much of a negative effect on our yeah. fertility. One of the goals that you said uh, you'd like is to try a six-week carving block. Um, tell us a bit more about why you want to do that and how you might go about doing it. Um, we just make life a lot easier, really, management and staff-wise. Um, I think it's you sort of get fed up of carving after eight weeks. And it's just nice to get it, get get in there, get it done, and get it out of the way. So. Lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. We um, just had another. Nice. Sorry. Sorry, I was just saying it's nice to have a nice gap between carving and AI as well to get all the cows, you know, in the right condition before you start breeding. Yeah. 
There was another question about the standing hay. Um, do, it says, do you carve on standing hay and do you use any mineral supplementation? Yeah, um, well, we carve um, for the first eight to seven weeks, we, uh, they are grazed on standing hay. And then for the last three weeks, they are on standing hay, but they also have uh, ad lib haylage as well. And then, yeah, we do um, have a liquid mineral system, which is which puts magnesium, iodine, selenium, copper, cobalt and zinc into the uh, water system. OK, one of your excellent uh, key performance indicators is milk from forage. So um, just looking at these pictures here, we've got uh, three nice clamps and also some bales. Just tell us a bit more about how you do silage making. Um, the uh, first cut is done in the first week of May, and that's only for dairy cows. Um, we try and get it about 30% dry matter, hopefully 12 ME. It's normally there or thereabouts. Um, we do second cut five to six weeks later, and that's just for the heifers and maybe um, the cows have it later in lactation if it's needed, if we run out of first cut. Um, bales are taken off the grazing platform for dry cows and, and the young stock as well. Yeah. And maize, we think it's a really, I think it's a brilliant crop for uh, autumn carving. It's normally consistent every year feed value wise, which helps them milk quite well. I know it's expensive, but it just really suits us here. Yeah. yeah. And a, a little bit about heifers um, and, and keeping them. Um, how many heifers would you rear each year? Um, we rear 90 heifers each year. Well, that's what we're going to aim to do. So we've always got 90 R1s and 90 R2s. And what happens to your bull calves, beef calves? Um, bull and beef calves are all sold um, two weeks old. It's just a local farmers in, the, in around South Leicestershire. Yeah. OK, so talk us through um, sort of your your rearing process in terms of uh, feed and management, how long they're on milk and concentrates for. Yeah, um, well, as soon as they're born, they're uh, fed four litres of colostrum and then again, 12 hours later. Mm -hmm. and then they go on to milk powder um, twice a day for seven weeks and then on once a day till weaning, really. And we, they're weaned at nine, 90 to 100 kilograms. Okay. Once they're rear, once they're weaned, they um, well they they have uh, ad lib rear and haylage until, until they're weaned, and then they're fed two kilograms of cake a day in grass silage. And also a, a, a grazing system. What sort of system have you got set up for heifers? Um, well, we've just got some land off farm. It's about sixty acres, and it's just split into five or six different fields, and we we just put them in one field and for a week and until they've grazed it right down and just moves them around around those fields so they are doing some sort of rotational grazing yeah it's, i mean it's not ideal but it's, it's it's better than set stocking i suppose exactly uh questions come in asking if you synchronize any heifers or cows we haven't done it but we are thinking about doing it with the heifers this year um doing a full cedar sync program but yeah, it's just an idea at the moment. We've not really. We need, we're going to speak to the vet about it in the coming months. Okay. Um, George, one of the things that you said you'd like to improve while being a strategic dairy farm is uh, cow mobility. What sort of lameness do you see in the herd? Mainly, we suffer from digital dermatitis in the winter months. Um, it's not so bad in the summer, but yeah, I mean, we foot bath with formalin four to five times a week it does seem to keep on top of it but it's just a just ongoing battle that we have it's been nice to learn if you know if other people have got any other ideas to help solve it and you also said about um, learning a bit more on mobility scoring yeah yeah you know we have to do regular mobility scoring for tesco um it's, it's when it first came in i didn't realize how helpful it'd actually be because you pick up lame cows before they're Really, you know, you pick up if you pick it up early, it makes such a difference. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned as well was focusing on power and machinery costs, something that you and Bell, Ben want to tackle. Can you just explain yeah. a bit more about this with the two farms? Yeah, well, um, the, we've got quite a lot of kit, and um, we just don't know what the right thing to do is because we've been to other, been to a lot of farms where they have no kit and contractors do it all, 
And then we've been to other farms where they don't have contractors and they do have all the kit and do it all themselves. Mm-hmm. And we just we, we we sit in the middle. We've got some kit we do, and we so we do a lot ourselves and we have contractors in. We just we don't know. We'd like to find out which is you know which is the right way to go. Or if there is a happy medium, what we do, you know, is the correct way. I think you also mentioned that because you've got your offline land is a few miles away as well. Yeah, yeah, because we've got it. All the offline land is in is in. Uh, three blocks of land furthest is about four or five miles away but it's just dragging slurry there and carting silage is it's a big cost to our business up, yeah and the age of kit some of it is quite old i think you said yeah we, well the newest tractor we've got about six years old five thousand hours on but then the next main tractor's done ten thousand hours it's ten years old and then scrape tractors i mean they're older than i am <laughs> quite vintage then yeah yeah okay so another question about uh, do you outwinter any young stock uh no we don't we've everything's reared in a shed um we are we have bought a couple of trailed calf feeders this year we're going to try and rear some calves outside till the winter sets in and then they'll be housed okay but no we don't uh, sl- slurry handling um do you know what your annual rainfall is Yes, yeah, about 26 inches. Okay. And just looking at this picture here, what is this of? That's just the uh, top slurry pit. It's just a clay bunded slurry pit. It's the old one that's from the, from the well, just, it was the first one they made when they came to Honeypot Farm. It's really so old. It's it just That just takes parlour, um, slurry from the parlour in the top cubicle shed. Okay, so now we've moved on to this. So this shows you how your farm has grown and spread over the years and you've had to plan and future-proof for slurry storage as well. How much can you store in this? Um, well, we can store about six to seven months worth of slurry for 400 cows. So I don't know the actual amount, but yeah, it's, it's, it's last winter, obviously, it was quite full because of the amount of rain, but we managed to hold it all in there just and tell us about how you get on with collecting it all into there and then emptying it out again what system um well we have uh contractors come with the umbilical kit and they umbilical it all around the farm and then it's tankered off farm onto, with uh, slurry tankers all onto the silage ground through the year and then at the end of the year we have to get a 360 in and uh, cart all the solid sand and muck away ready for winter Okay, so a bit on the irrigation here. Yeah, we've got uh, dirty water towers, which all the dirty water runs in, um, parlour washings and everything. uh, And that's just irrigated around a grazing platform uh, 12 months of the year. It's a brilliant bit of kit, that is. It's really good. We've just got another film to show, just to give you an idea of what's like with the cows coming in. And uh, while that's showing, we'd like to just talk about uh, some of the investment that you have made so I'll get you to unmute yourself okay I'd just like to point out that this film has been speeded up and these cows don't normally come in at a fast gallop Uh, George which building are they going into there that's a collecting yard um, so and then the parlour's obviously in front of it and the shed to the right is where we our heifers are uh, kept all winter okay and you've invested quite a bit in the business over the years so that collecting yard bit's obviously quite recent how much money have you spent well we've added a hundred cubicles um down the, at the bottom of the farm which cost uh, sixty thousand pounds and we upgraded the parlor it was a 2040 forward um and now it's a 6030 with an adf um, yeah, that cost about £100,000. We've had to build a new silage clamp further down, a concrete one. That was a £40,000 and prob- probably spent about £10,000 on grazing infrastructure in the last three years. And obviously the new units cost in total about £1.2 million, but that's including the purchase of 200 cows. OK, that's nice. That will lead us on to um, asking Ben. Um, about the second unit what's the background to setting this up well we wanted to uh, keep expanding as a farm but unfortunately with the farm layout at the home farm 
we couldn't milk any more cows. So there's mm -hmm. only one op other option to uh, to look for another unit. Yeah. Um, so we purchased 140 acres of land, which backed onto existing farm three years ago. From mm -hmm. there, we looked at um, doing a contract farming agreement with a dairy farmer uh, next door. But unfortunately, um, financially, it wasn't going to work for uh, both parties. Right. Um, it was a consultant from our description group, Gainer, who said, why don't we build a brand new unit, um, grass both of the home, both of the farms down, and then just bring all yep. the forage in from our other uh, rented land. Okay. So if we look at this, before we play the film, because we've got an overhead view of this farm, just tell us what we can see, Ben, left to right. So obviously on the left, you've got the, the slurry lagoon. Um, down at the bottom of the screen, you've got the milking parlour, which is a 32, 64 swing over Waikato. Mm -hmm. um, and in the middle, we've got a cubicle housing shed. And then at the top, you've got three self-feed silage clamps. There's uh, one grass is in the middle and the two other side is a uh, maze. Okay, and why did you set it up like that? Um, well, basically, I've been around uh, quite a few farmers, especially down in, in Sussex with our discussion group, and there are big okay. cell feeders down there. Um, mm -hmm. I managed to get quite a good few tips from them. And uh, one of the important things is to make sure that the wind comes from the back of the silage clamp, so any rain doesn't go on the uh, the surface of the clamp. Well, that's and, good. Um, no, and also it all slope down uh, downhill towards the slurry pit, which is makes uh, handling the dirty water a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. If we play this film, we get a good overhead look of the um, farm, put some of the grazing, and then ask Ben to unmute yourself so you can tell us uh, what we can see. Okay. Um, so there we get that view of the the parlour and the cubicles and the stylish clamps. What's this? Um, grey patch to the front uh, there with the white car on it. So that is a new shed we're putting it up for calves. It's going to be a loose housing shed so we'll use that from kind of um, September to late October for carving and then in the winter um, we can, we've can we got some loose housing for any uh, any kind of mastitis or lame cows. Okay and all around you that's grazing how many acres hectares have you got? We've got 93 hectares on this grazing platform and the parlour yeah. sits right in the middle of it so it's quite a good uh, quite a good spot. It's really nice that you've been able to start this from scratch and set it up properly isn't it? Yeah it is yeah it took a lot of uh, thinking we wanted to do it right first time and um, I think we were, uh, we're quite happy with how we've done it. That's really good. Okay. It will move us on to asking about business matters. And this is questions really for both Ben and George. You're both keen to take the business forward with the two farms. You do run separate business budgets for each farm, but you say that you want to do things like improve your staff management skills. What other areas would you like to improve in? Uh me it's more like uh, kind of looking after the business i've i've uh, been on a couple of courses uh, with you guys and that's helped me understand the business a bit more and setting up budgets and everything which is uh, mm -hmm. quite important like, going forward yeah well i just see it as a sort of extra add-on to a discussion group just have been able to expand more and get more people's views on our farm and how we can improve what we do i found yeah. the best way of learning um, in agriculture, it's good by going around people's farms and seeing how they do that everything. Yeah, so that that's one of the reasons why you wanted to be a strategic dairy farmer, isn't it? To get everybody on your farm. Yeah. And uh, what the, your goals are quite stretchy, being in the top 5% nationally and making 10p a litre. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not so, if we don't get there, we don't get there, but it's, you might as well aim high, haven't you? That's good. We'll look, have a look at some of your current key performance indicators because that will show us um, where you are doing well and where you want to improve. So if we um, look at these, the Honeypot Farm numbers have been put through our AHDB KPI key performance indicator calculator. This is downloadable from our website and um, what you will see is a table of results like this. And um, if you put your farm details in, it'll appear on the far right hand column. There you can see Honeypot Farm. 
And um, if you look down the figures, you'll be able to see, for instance, cows and heifers calved within the first six weeks is 75%, excellent performance is over 90%. So that gives them something to aim for. And all the way down, these have been put together with uh, industry input. So if we look at this, George, just um, tell us, this is cows and heifers calved in the first six weeks. It's nice and easy to see on this with the colour chart. What did you think when you first saw this kind of result? Uh, well, it's just not good enough really for it to be, what, to, to block calf. Well, it's okay to block calf, but if you want a six, seven, eight week block, it's just not good enough at all. Okay, something for you to work on. Yeah. What about this one though? And I'll just point out to everybody that it's a simple colour coded system, but some people were doing so well, we had to have um, a blue box on the end. So you're at 5,000 litres. How do you feel about that one? Yeah, it was a, it's a really proud figure, to be honest with you. Just concentrate so well on making forage. It's, we're just really pleased where we are with that. That's really good. And this one, full economic net margin. What did you think about this result? Uh, yeah, it was OK. It could be better, but it's still, it's still in the green. So it's not, good. Could, be, could be worse. OK. Uh, thank you for that. We um, will just like to say that in future meetings, we'll focus on some of these things that have been mentioned. Target to be in the top 5%, we'll look around uh, the business side of that, and making 10p a litre profit, but they both say they don't want to compromise cow health and welfare. Uh, they want to look at a six-week carving block and actually see if it fits their business and their lifestyle, uh, looking at reducing lameness. And uh, the logistics of operating two farms as one in one business. Uh, they've also mentioned about looking at genetics for grazing cows. They want to improve staff management. And of course, we mentioned power plant and machinery costs. Thanks, George and Ben and Martin. Um, if you'd like to ask them a question or to clarify or repeat a point, please use that chat box on to the right there. And we'll run through the answers after we've heard from Nick Parsons. He's AHDB's Head of Dairy Development. And Nick's going to explain how Honeypot Farm is part of a network of 25 strategic dairy farms throughout Britain, how it's set up and funded, and most importantly, how you can take part. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, uh, George, Ben, Martin, uh, for agreeing to do the launch uh, in, a, uh, in a webinar rather than uh, how we would all prefer to be doing uh, a farm meeting at this point. And um, I just wanted to go through uh, the development stages and the way that uh, the strategic dairy farms are, uh, are developing. Uh, we're covering a, a nationwide now uh, coverage of, of the uh, farms, the uh, fit with the optimal dairy systems and the map to the right here shows the 16, uh, 16 farms that we've got uh, launched, including uh, which is the white star uh, of uh, the Wades and Honeypot uh, in Leicestershire. The uh, strips below each of the farms highlights what they, uh, uh, the optimal dairy system. So it flags whether they're an all year round carver or a block carver in the spring or autumn. So that can be found on the, uh, found on the website. And the whole concept of strategic dairy farms is based on the uh, Farm Excellence platform, which uh, covers all the sectors and was started uh, in cereals and potatoes uh, originally, and has now uh, left us with uh, uh, a legacy across all the uh, uh, sectors and 16 of the uh, 25, as, as uh, Shirley pointed out, have been recruited and uh, the white stars also reflect the, uh, the other farms that we're uh, trying to recruit. So where, we, uh, where we're trying to uh, move through the COVID change that we've had to take into consideration, uh, it's um, uh, very much turned us uh, to a digital platform at the moment and uh, we feel that we've moved uh, forward uh, at least three years in the acceptance of farmers and uh, stakeholders joining in, uh, in on the uh, digital launches as well as the digital meetings that we've held. We've had uh, significant uh, numbers of farmers and, uh, and stakeholders joining those and also the uh, participation 
in the uh, discussion, uh, as you've seen today with the questions that we've uh, been answering and, and are coming through and still continue to come through. And uh, I would encourage you to feed back through the questionnaire at the end of the at the end of the webinar to what you believe uh, how we can move forward. And we continue to want to learn and uh, uh, recognize what farmers are, are then changing on the back of these webinars. So any feedback that you can give through that would be much appreciated. So it's very much uh, looking forward, a digital and a physical mix of uh, meetings once we can get back out onto farm. And we'll use the strategic dairy farms as a vehicle for research and development delivery. So uh, the latest one we had at the start of July, which you can go to YouTube and find is around Quarter Pro, which has been developed in uh, association with the University of Nottingham. And uh, looking forward, we'll also have uh, a reflection on the uh, mobility tools that, uh, that are being developed as well through the same partnership. We are also looking to develop, and uh, Shirley mentioned earlier, we, we measure those KPIs and encourage everybody to uh, work through benchmarking. And uh, using that KPI calculator, as we have for the uh, Wade's Farm at Honeypot, uh, we can uh, measure those farms and uh, compare them as we just have seen through uh, industry averages and challenge, uh, challenge those farms to continue to improve. And you can do that yourself through the, uh, uh, through the uh, KPI calculator. We are also in development of and hope to launch in the early autumn an express tool which will give you the opportunity to compare yourself on one or two of the nine KPIs that we uh, use within the calculator, you'll be able to choose one or two or full nine of those to be able to compare individual KPIs and start to challenge yourself to, uh, to move forward in, uh, in productivity. Thank you. And uh, just my final slide highlighting the website and encouraging you all to uh, follow the uh, development of those farms that we have within the uh, within the Strategic Dairy Farm Network. All 16 have web pages, uh, reasons to view, reasons to follow those farms, and uh, be able to tie your own farm and the way your system works with one of those 16 uh, that have a very similar system. Therefore, you can uh, follow that farm through uh, the, the webinars that we're holding, the meetings that we're holding. If they're not geographically close to you, at least you can then visit visit the website and uh, be able to follow those uh, those units uh, even if you can't get to the farm meetings themselves so thank you for the opportunity shirley just to uh, widen the view of what we're doing with the strategic dairy farm network and i hand back to you to uh, sum up thanks uh, any questions uh, please type into the chat box on the right. We've still got a few minutes uh, where we can um, answer them. So um, can we just uh, ask George and uh, Ben maybe to answer some of these questions I've got. How much concentrate do you feed into the cows? Uh, Honeypot farm, we feed about 1.6 uh, tonnes per cow a year, and that's been slightly less at 1.4, isn't it? Yeah, about 1.4, yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. And um, there's a question about how fresh cows are fed and managed. So I suppose that's a bit about colostrum mob management, is it? Um, is it, oh, is it what we, well, when they're carved, um, the yeah. milk, they have six milkings and they go back in the main herd and they're, they're, they stay out, they graze night and day um, for about six weeks until they come in. It's on a high energy cake. Yeah. What are the cows bedded on in winter and how does it impact with mastitis? Well, we were at loose housing um, years ago and then we switched to sand bedded cubicles and it's had a massive impact on mastitis. Um, it's brilliant, really. It's a bit of a pain slurry wise, but you can't, uh, you can't beat it really for, uh, mas for helping mastitis. Yeah. Um, another question is how long are you farm tenancies? Uh, well, we just renegotiated re 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 our farm tenancies. Um, Cliff was very good. Is uh, we actually sold a six-acre farm, six-acre piece of land in the village, 
and he bought the 140 acres uh, next to us in a ring fence. He's now rented it back to Garner and Wade uh, on a 40 year FBT. Wow, that's good. Um, there's a question that says, if we see a substantial shift towards block carving, do you envisage a price penalty for uneven monthly production for yourselves? I think that is. Um, at the moment, it actually favours our contract. Um, we get quite a big bonus in the autumn for our milk. Um, one month, we got a nearly a 20% increase. Um, and yeah, we don't really get when we if we do get penalised in the spring, it's very slight, and we're not sending many litres anyway. So. Uh, I don't know if everybody does it change to block carbon it could could affect it but at the moment it doesn't okay another one on the concentrate feeding how much concentrate do you feed per day between carving and serving feed seven kilos of cake a day per head that's and the that maximum we'll the feed. Yeah. yeah that's three and a half each milking and that's the maximum we will feed yeah um, another one is, um, how easy do you think it is to change from all year round carving to a block autumn carving herd? Oh, as I said before, it's, 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 neither, it's not easy, it's not hard, it's just it's your mindset. It's, it's quite, you, you go from carving 30 cows a month to 30 car, cows in two, day, in two days, so it's a bit of a change and you kind of make sure that you do have the right facilities to manage all your calves in one hit. And all your or place to carve all your cows in that can be quite challenging you've got to set yourself up for it yeah we had to spend a lot of money to, to work to get there okay but now you're saving money and time aren't you yeah exactly yeah it was a yeah it was an investment okay. rather than so uh, leading on from that the, another question came in that says what do you need to focus on to achieve a tight carving block and well, the dry cows really, the dry period is really important, and especially making sure you've got your cows in the right condition before you dry them off. You don't really want to be drying any fat or skinny cows off, um, and just breeding them from the right genetics, and making sure that they've, they've got high energy levels all the time. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, thanks very much, George, Ben, and Martin, and also to Nick Parsons, and uh, thank you for listening. If you're interested uh, in following their story online, please Google AHDB Dairy plus Strategic Farms. You can um, look out for updates on social media. And just remember that if you're a Dairy Pro member, please type your name, farm name and membership number into the questions box to register for um, points. Um, we hope you'll be able to join us when we're back on farm and do your bit to help Garner and Wade achieve their goals over the next three years with plenty of discussion, challenging questions and sharing experiences. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time, your participation and attention today and goodbye. <laughs>